wrote three novels before writing a book, How Proust Can Change Your Life, which became a bestseller and changed his life. He has since penned several books, all of them international hits. They're both confessional and essayistic. His topics range from literature to travel and, as we're about to hear, architecture. Alain de Botton, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Thank you. Now, Wittgenstein was one of the relatively few thinkers who combined an interest in architecture, a practical interest, because he built a modernist house for his sister in Vienna, but also a theoretical interest. But he famously said, you think philosophy is difficult, but I tell you, it's nothing compared to the difficulty of being a good architect. You quoted that in your book, The Architecture of Happiness. Now, is it fair to describe that book as an investigation of the idea encapsulated in Wittgenstein's remark? Yes, I mean, partly, and partly, really, it's an attempt to look at the question of what is beautiful in architecture. What is a beautiful building, and how do we know when we see one, and what's going on when we describe something as beautiful? It falls, I guess, quite traditionally in the long line of books of aesthetics. So what is beauty in architecture? Well, I think it's many things. The way I look at it is I think that when we describe buildings as beautiful, really what we're alluding to is material versions of many of the qualities which we think of as good in other parts of life. So there's a real correspondence between what you might broadly call virtue, human virtue, as listed by, say, Aristotle in his ethics, different qualities that you might find in a good person. Many of these things have analogies with things that are going on in a good building. And you pick this up when people talk about buildings. They'll say, that building looks a bit arrogant, or that building looks looks heavy or that building looks elegant. These are words in which you can both praise and damn humans and buildings. And really my my book is an attempt to identify certain themes that are likely to be going on in buildings that are satisfying. But there's also a sense of the potential moral force of buildings, the way a building might seem to promise to make your life go better. Yes, I mean, again, this is a traditional question of aesthetics, which is, can good art make us into good people? And the hope is always, yes, it can. The way I look at it is, I think that works of art do have a moral, in the sense that they do have suggestions about how we might behave. You can look at a glass, a chair, a picture, and it has certain suggestions about what might be appropriate behaviour if we were to take that work of art seriously. But these are merely suggestions rather than binding laws. Good architecture is a suggestion about good behaviour, but nothing more nor less than that. It's intriguing for me that you've so far talked about art and architecture interchangeably as if it's obvious that architecture is art. Is that what you believe? I think the side of architecture that's the subject of my book and that's that interests me is very close to art and I think yes it can be called art there are of course other sides architecture is also business it's also about shelter it's about putting your clothes away it's about lots of other things but insofar as it's been a prestigious and you know meaningful activity I think it's because people have seen it in the way they've seen many of the other art forms but it's also clearly got a functional element and that became most obvious with modernist architecture architects like Le Corbusier arguing that the form should actually follow on from the function. I think that that proposal that form should follow function has been one of the great red herrings of modernist architecture because, of course, the function of a building, when we first hear that sentence, seems to be identified with the mechanical side of things, the sheltering side, whereas, of course, the real function of a building encompasses both sheltering and also what Ruskin calls speaking. There's a lovely quote from Ruskin where he says that buildings shouldn't just shelter us, they should also speak to us, and then he says they should speak to us of all the things that we think are most important and that we need to be reminded of on a daily basis. So the idea that buildings should be the repositories of certain values, ideas, suggestions, and that they should reflect these back to us so as to inspire us. That kind of boldness, that conceptual boldness that Ruskin goes in for, I think gets to the heart of why we really care about buildings in a way that we don't care so much about forks or or completely functional, mechanically functional objects. To go back to Le Corbusier, he did talk about machines for living. In his writings, he was emphasising grain silos, ships, examples where people have been focusing on achieving a certain sort of functional elegance with a byproduct that you get a very streamlined design. I think that people like Le Corbusier or Mies van der Rohe found many of the works of technology, 19th and 20th century technology, very beautiful. And that's why they liked them. They didn't like them because they were functional. They liked them because they were beautiful. But it didn't fit their agenda to suggest that that was why. And so they appealed to science as the most prestigious force in society. So if you had an intemperate client 
and you wanted to try and persuade them that the roof should be one shape rather than another, rather than saying, oh, well, I'd like this shape because it's beautiful. If you say to them, ah, no, 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 it's like this because of science. Science dictates it. That's much more convincing. And we find that same argument going on nowadays with ecological architecture, the same emphasis on the idea that the reason why buildings look a certain way is because the ecological scientific program has demanded it. If you talk to Norman Foster about you know, why the Reichstag looks the way it does, he won't ever, ever, ever mention the word beauty, but he'll constantly mention air circulation, water pumps, etc, etc. There's almost been a taboo in architecture about the most visceral and interesting aspect of what architects are up to, which is, is it beautiful or not? Yes, in your book you talked about the flat roof of modernism, which is clearly not scientifically a rational way to build, but it's sold to the client as the rational way to build. But actually it's there for reasons of elegance and beauty. That's right. It's there because, to go back to Ruskin, it's speaking about the right things. What the architects of the modernist movement wanted was, as it were, a stage set for a particular way of life that would be democratic, elegant, based around technology as an almost a mystical force for solving problems, and one could be awestruck, as previous generations might have been awestruck at the power of nature, one could be awestruck at the power of technology. So it was, a, if you like, a romantic attraction to technology, and whether or not it worked was, I genuinely think, secondary. So even if you look at an architect like Mies van der Rohe, many of his skyscrapers, despite his insistence on the idea that he's a builder and he doesn't care about aesthetics, they've got all sorts of what you could call fake detailing. Many of the detailing around his skyscrapers are there simply for reasons of aesthetics. They serve absolutely no mechanical purpose. I don't mind. I think that's great. All the better for it. But there's an intellectual dishonesty. So if we accept that beauty is actually the key concept in, in architecture, that puts us in a strange position. It kind of invites an aestheticism about living, where many of us think that aestheticism is not necessarily the right way to live. Foregrounding beauty above certain sort of ethical issues. This has always been a sort of great tension. You find this tension in, in the history of Christianity, most famously in the battles between the Catholics and the Protestants about what, what you're going to do with the church. You know, do you need to spend a lot of money putting angels on the ceiling and gilding pilasters? Or actually, can you just get on and worship in a bare room? And you find sort of secular versions of this argument. You know, should we, as it were, get on with living? Or should we worry about the door handles? I don't think it's an either-or situation. We're an extremely wealthy civilization, and we deserve to get both aspects of life right. Of course there is such a thing as taking beauty too seriously. Oscar Wilde was helpful in the history of humanity for showing us what can happen when the love of beauty gets out of hand. His claims that he'd be more upset by the wrong kind of wallpaper than a death in the family. It's that sort of extremity that helpfully reminds us that there are all sorts of things that have claims on us, family life, political life, etc. And that a well-ordered life means slotting these in at the right moment. But to say that beauty has no claim on us is also going too far. I was just thinking of somebody who hadn't got much money who's condemned to live in a kind of world of landlord kitsch. Now, that person doesn't have an option of beauty. Some people have responded to that by thinking, if we then start saying that beauty is very important and there are people who are not enjoying beauty, then that will make that person's life very miserable. So that seems like an unkind thing to do and we must surely focus on the positive. That's one way of interpreting the situation. The other way of interpreting the situation is to say... If we genuinely think that beauty is important, and there are some people who really don't have any access to beauty, rather than denying that this is a problem, we should absolutely admit that this is a problem and try and fix it. And it's the grossest form of patronisation and cruelty to pretend it's not important. And you only need to spend time with people whose lives are genuinely materially and practically hard to realise that beauty matters more than ever. And that taste that we would call the chocolate box taste, the idea of making an interior extremely sweet, very over-decorated, lots of pictures, lots of stuff going on. That's frequently associated with people whose lives are very hard. In other words, it's not as though if your life is hard, you're happy to be living in a bare concrete cell. You're frequently going to be taking quite extreme and actually quite naive steps to try and improve it and aestheticise it. What is the garden gnome? I say somewhere in my book that the impulses that lead to the garden gnome are very interesting and should not be dismissed. It's the garden gnome itself that should be questioned. It's an impatient response to a genuine desire for sweetness in lives that are very hard.
So you're not a relativist about beauty. There is an absolute right answer about which things are beautiful and which not. Again, it's something that if you force the issue, you can sort of tie yourself in knots. It's rather like literature. Can we say that Shakespeare's good or is the cornflake packet as good as Shakespeare, etc.? I fall in the common sense thing and the sort of Humean idea that if people for centuries have seen some value in Shakespeare, there's likely to be something in it. We can't say definitively what is beautiful and what is ugly in the way that we can say, does water boil at this temperature or that temperature? These are not scientific truth these are humanistic truths that doesn't mean that they're not valuable truths because after all we are human beings so they're part of societies almost you could call conventions and a stock of ideas and it's sort of extreme politeness and skepticism that has led us to a situation where many of the most intelligent and most privileged people in our society will hesitate to say that building Y is better than building Z, even if it's utterly obvious. So while the philosophers are debating this, Barrett Holmes come along and go, oh, well, I've heard that there's a real debate about what's beautiful. So this is our answer. And if you don't like it, well, you must be a snob. This has been a gift to property developers, this debate. So if beauty is in part about the relation between objective qualities in the world and the perceiving person... One way of changing things is not to change the world, but to change the perceiver. And it seems to me that part of what you're doing is trying to move people into a direction where they are prepared to change. I mean, you talk about recognising the aesthetic beauty of a wall of concrete. That's something which is not easy for a lot of people, but with a certain kind of Mm. attention, it's possible to make a change in one's life and one's perceptions. I think what writers, have, many writers have traditionally done, is to try and, and interest people in things that they didn't know they were interested in, to validate areas of curiosity. I think it's an odd feature about the way human beings work, that there are many things that we're interested in that we don't know if it's OK to be interested in them. You know, it's one of the sort of minor tragedies of social life, that you're often in a group of people and you'll go, God, isn't it amazing the way that leaves sway in the wind? And you might be at school or in a particular sort of unsympathetic area, and people go, oh, well, that's pretentious, or what's that nonsense? And then one of the great things about life is discovering that actually some people do think that's important, and there is a weight that's accorded to that experience. And then there are other things which we simply had never really looked at, and we'd had bad associations around. You know, maybe someone had told us, oh, concrete, that's that nasty stuff they used to use in tower blocks in the 60s, and we sort of just never went any further with that thought. Someone comes along and says, actually, look, you know, yes, some things went a little bit wrong, but let's look at concrete. It's an ancient and fascinating material, etc. And that gives you licence then to develop and deepen that interest. And I think that's the role of the critic in many, many art forms, to legitimate certain questions and certain sensitivities. And if you had to pick out a building that is for you particularly beautiful, which would it be? Well, in London, as we're sitting in London, I think that something like Tate Modern is an example of a building that does a lot of things well. It reminds us that a good building, a civic building, should make a city more livable. It should be a place of encounter. It's also a building that projects certain ideals. Many buildings traditionally have projected ideals of nobility, the wisdom of ancient Greece and Rome, traditional ideas of, say, classical architecture. And architects have struggled to come up with the idea of what values modern buildings might be proposing seems to me that a building like Tate Modern is a quintessentially modern British building. And if one said, what do we want life in Britain to be like? I'd quite like to say I would like life in modern Britain to be a bit like Tate Modern, i.e. to project qualities of civic mindedness, of community, a kind of democratic quality that's still quite dignified, the idea that something could be for everybody but of very high quality. Also, it's a building that interestingly fuses the past and the present, which is something that British life is very cut up about and divided about, it manages to make that quite seamless. So, yes, that's one building that is not just a good building,